thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, obviously, this is a uh, picture of, um, of, the, of the marathon in New, New York right now, and as you'll see why RAD is going to win the race uh, today. Okay, so um, let's briefly talk about cardiac EC coupling. Uh, every time the heart uh, beats and the uh, myocytes contract, calcium comes in through the L-type calcium channel, and that calcium then activates the ryanidine receptors, and that flood of calcium then acts, activates the myofilaments to allow for uh, excitation contraction coupling. The calcium is then pumped back up into the SR again, and the same amount of calcium that comes in through the L-type calcium channel is pumped out of the cell as the cell relaxes. During ad adrenergic stimulation, epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to beta adrenergic receptors, activate cyclic AMP, protein kinase A, and this is going to lead to an increase in heart rate, increase in the contraction force, increase in blood pressure. The PKA activates um, L-type calcium channel. There's more cal calcium influx into the cell. This has been explored for, for many years. Uh, for about 50 years now, it's been known that um, L-type calcium channel influx occurs in the heart, um, and in, it's been studied in, in, by multiple investigators, and what's characteristic is an increase in open probability of the channel, increase in open time of the channel as well. This is seen in single-channel recordings and also in whole-cell um, recordings of uh, cardiac myocytes. As what, there are other targets for protein kinase A in the heart as well. Uh, the ryanidine receptor has been proposed to be a, a target as well, as, as is phospholambam, uh, which uh, disinhibits circa activity. So PKA phosphorylates something in the calcium channel complex, as I'll speak about, ryanidine receptor, phospholambam, the slowly activating delayed rectifier, and this is all going to increase the calcium trigger, increase calcium release, uh, and uptake, which is going to lead to the increased uh, inotropy. But the mechanism of the augmented calcium influx uh, by the adrenergic receptor has not been known, as not known. There are multiple potential targets in the cell, including the calcium channel itself, either the alpha, alpha subunit, alpha 1C in the heart, or the beta subunits. There are other multiple targets, uh, multiple tar proteins that are known to be in that complex. The one thing that is very clear, though, is that an inhibitor of uh, protein kinase A is, will block this process, meaning that PKA and the phosphorylation that PKA does is an important component of this process. For about the last 20 or 30 years, um, serine 19 1928 on the carboxy terminus of the poor forming subunit was felt to be, for at some point in time, the only phosphorylation site. Later, that story was changed and that there were other phosphorylation sites as well. Brian O'Rourke, who's at Hopkins, did a really interesting experiment uh, about 20 years ago now, in which he introduced uh, via adenovirus a dihydropyridine resistant. Um, channel into um, isolated cardiac myocytes and definitively show, showed that 1928 phosphorylation was irrelevant for adrenergic regulation in cardiac myocyte. That created quite a bit of buzz in the field. Um, I was in the audience when, it, when, he, when he presented that work. I didn't necessarily believe it. Others didn't either. I made a knock in mouse. Uh, but was scooped by another group that made the same knock in mouse that showed in, in mice uh, 1928 was irrelevant for adrenergic regulation. There were other phosphorylation sites that were proposed as well over time, and in fact, they're still being proposed. It's almost like whack-a-mole, where every, every few months there's another phosphorylation site only to be shown to be not irrelevant in a, in a cardiac mice site. And so we developed a, a, a different approach in which we um, created dihydropyridine resistant transgenic animals and made them cardiac specific and made them doxycycline inducible. And in part because Henry Colcraft Col Col showed that there's an inverse relationship between the basal uh, current and 
the ability for the channel to be regulated by adrenergic stimulation. And so we made them doxycycline inducible. In fact, we only had to give them doxycycline overnight, and that was enough to see the expression of, of the channels. And in this way, we were able to relatively quickly study any phosphorylation site we, we wanted to. And we, we, we published several papers showing as we incrementally increased the number of uh, phosphorylation sites studied. So finally, we, we created a, a, a mouse in which we mutated about 50 phosphorylation sites at 35 regions within the alpha-1C subunit. We mutated any serine or threonine with an arginine or lysine or a histidine, one, two, or three residues upstream of it. So we would just remove any potential phosphorylation site uh, within, the, within the channel. And we found that the channel surprisingly expressed pretty well in these cardiac myocytes, but yet adrenergic regulation was normal, meaning that phosphorylation of the alpha subunit was not required for uh, PKA regulation of the channel. We did the same thing on the beta subunit. There, there, there were 28 regions, 37 sites that we mutated to an alanine, and adrenergic regulation was normal in this mouse as well. And then we crossed the two mice together. So we had about 90 potential phosphorylation sites. And I should say they're potential phosphorylation sites, because we don't know that they really were there. We just know that they could be potentially phosphorylation sites. We just removed them all. And there, too, the, there was normal adrenergic regulation of uh, the L-type calcium channel. I think what we could conclude from this, this work was that PK phosphorylation of the calcium channel subunits themselves were not required for regulation. And this is probably the reason why no one was able to figure it out for so many years, because it's not the subunits themselves that are, are, are the targets. There's some other, there's some other protein that's, that's around that is required for this process to occur. Now, we, we went on to look at many other potential things. We, 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 went to, we found that the beta subunit was required for this process, because if we made a channel in which we mutated the beta subunit binding to the alpha subunit, we lost regulation. We also looked to see whether the proteolytic cleavage of the channel was required. There was a whole dogma, and there's still a dogma in the field, unfortunately, that proteolytic cleavage is required for adrenergic regulation. So we mapped the, phos the, we mapped the proteolytic cleavage sites, and we removed them from the channel. We made a transgenic mouse again and demonstrated that even in the absence of the proteolytic cleavage of the alpha-1C subunit, adrenergic regulation was normal. So proteolytic cleavage is absolutely not required for this process, but beta subunit is required for this process to occur. So what is that missing protein? So Alice Ting had developed a method of uh, creating, um, using ascorbate peroxidase in which she uh, uh, studied the mitochondrial proteome by attaching ascorbate peroxidase to a mitochondrial protein and looking to see what is biotinylated in the neighborhood around those proteins. We adapted the same methodology for a cardiac myocyte. Again, because the, the, the regulation could not be reconstituted in any artificial system. So we had to do it in a cardiac myocyte. And so we created two transgenic animals, an alpha-1C apex mouse and a beta subunit apex mouse. And the reasoning is, is that the, the biotinylation that's ensued after activating this peroxidase is approximately 20 nanometers around that protein. And within the T-tubule region between the L-type calcium channel and the ryanodine receptor, the space is about 12 nanometers. So we, would, we figured that we would be biotinylating the entire region around, around, the, around uh, the calcium channel. Now, we worked on this for many years after Alice Ting's paper. We saw this, and we realized that we wanted to adapt this to cardiac myocytes, and we struggled. And we struggled because there were so many proteins this is a, that, that were biotinylated. This is a really full neighborhood, 
And we weren't able to distinguish between those proteins that were bystanders and those who were actually uh, interacting with the channel. At that point, we, 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 we met uh, Steve Giggy, who uh, was at Harvard, and he uh, put, put me in touch with his postdoc, Marion Kolotsky. And, uh, and he and Guosha Liu, who was working in my lab, worked on this method for quite a while until it, it worked. And the basic methodology that we used is we isolated cardiac myocytes, and then we treated them with biotin phenol uh, for about uh, 30 minutes, and then um, exposed them to either isoproteranol or no isoproteranol. Uh, a short burst of hydrogen peroxide activates the peroxidase, and then we label the neighborhood around the channel. And what we're looking for is we were looking for a difference between what is the difference between no isoproteranol and isoproteranol. And what we found, we found a protein called RAD was reduced about 50% in the neighborhood around the channel in both the alpha-1C and the beta-2 uh, apex mice. Now, we also did it in, um, in a whole heart. We uh, um, uh, incubated, we, we, we hung a heart, and while it was beating, we did this experiment as well, and we found the same thing that RAD was reduced in the neighborhood around the channel. But importantly, in a, in a heart that was not uh, transgenic and did not have apex, RAD was unchanged in the, in, in the whole heart, meaning that RAD is depleted in the neighborhood around the calcium channel, but not globally. When we looked at all three methods that we, we used, uh, what we found is that RAD was depleted Completed in, in the neighborhood around the calcium in all three methods, in isolated cardiac myocytes and in whole heart. And interestingly, in some of these examples, we see that PKA was also recruited to the channel in response to isoproternal. So what we had concluded from these experiments is that RAD was likely going to be maybe the target for ad adrenergic stimulation. So what's known about RAD? So very briefly, RAD was identified as a protein that's overexpressed in uh, diabetes in skeletal muscle, the function of which is still not known in, in skeletal muscle. It's expressed predominantly in the heart, lung, and in skeletal muscle. It's a known calcium channel inhibitor, and that's been known for quite some, some time. And many people in the audience have been working on um, RAD and GEM and uh, REM. These are, these are all family members. Um, it's also a known phosphorylate. It's a known protein that's phosphorylated. From, from the old days, Ronald Kahn, who identified um, RAD, had shown that RAD can be phosph phosphorylated by multiple kinases. But probably most importantly, Jonathan Satin, um, worked on, worked, who's worked on RAD for about a decade now, demonstrated that in cardiac myocytes, in a RAD null mice, he showed that uh, the calcium current was increased and there was no adrenergic regulation of the channel. We put that all together to say that RAD may be one of the targets. Now, there are other reasons why RAD might not have been the target, but in the interest of time, I've, I've left out that slide today. Needless to say, we, we, we then tried to work on methods to uh, reconstitute expression, which has been so uh, challenging for people over many years. And indeed, if we just express the alpha 1C subunit and the beta subunit, we don't see regulation either. The blue is after forskolin, and there's no regulation that we see. But when we expressed RAD in, in, a, in, a, in a hex cell, and we, we did it with some limiting amounts of RAD, so we didn't want to over, overwhelm the system, uh, and use perforated patch clamp methods, we, we observed that we could now see regulation of the channel. Here's baseline, here's with forskolin, and we see, regu we see a pretty profound regulation. Now, it's not every cell has it, but many cells obviously have a substantial amount of regulation. And also what we were able to see is a, a shift in the, in the V50. So uh, what's characteristic of adrenergic regulation is a shift to the left, in response to, in response to uh, forskolin or isoproteranol, and we're able to reconstitute that as well. We did uh, mass spec looking for the phosphorylation sites, again with Marion, and we found multiple phosphorylation sites on the, on the, uh, uh, in RAD. Uh, 
And when we, when we mutated those phosphorylation sites, we mutated either the four phosphorylation sites or the two phosphorylation sites on the carboxy terminus, we lost regulation of, of, uh, of uh, the L-type calcium channel in a hex cell. This is transferable to other voltage-gated calcium channels. So this is an example of CAV1.3, which is expressed in, for instance, in the atria, in the sinus node. We see that we're able to reconstitute adrenergic regulation in these types of calcium channels as well. And indeed, the RAD is conserved throughout, throughout evolution. These four phosphorylation sites are also very well conserved um, in, from, from evo in evolution. And they're also con conserved in the other members of this family of RGKs as well. We looked at CAV2.2, which is um, uh, not a cardiac channel, but also is dependent upon beta subunit binding. And um, we see that when we overexpress RAD or we express REM, we see regulation as well here. So this seems to be a, a relatively universal mechanism to explain regulation of, of a channel, of, of a voltage-gated calcium channel by protein kinase A. Indeed, what our model would be is that RAD on the carboxy terminus associates with the membrane because of negative, because of positive charges and, and, and hydrophobicity, and that allows for it to bind to the beta subunit and inhibit the channel under basal conditions. After phosphorylation, RAD comes off of the membrane, disassociates from beta, and now you get the increase in calcium influx here. So what we have is we, we, we hypothesize, as you'll see, that in a heart there are two types of, of uh, calcium channels. One which is inhibited by, by RAD under basal conditions, and that forms the adrenergic reserve, and one that is not inhibited by RAD, it's not bound to RAD, and that's forming our EC coupling under basal conditions. So the next step is to see what the functional effects of that in a in a in a in a um, in a heart cell is. Up to now, we've only shown that we can reconstitute things in a in, a, in an artificial system. So we made a, a, a knock-in mouse in which we uh, we knocked in alanines at the four potential phosphorylation sites: 25, 30, 38, 272, and uh, 300. This mouse survives normally, it breeds normally, and the hearts look, uh, look normal as well. Uh, when we look at uh, L-type calcium channel current, we see that under wild-type conditions, if we add isoproterenol, the current doubles or triples, but in these rad mutant mice, there's absolutely no, there's no change in current, meaning that phosphorylation of rad is essential for adrenergic regulation of the, of the L-type calcium channel. And this is with both forskolin and with isoproterenol. In the atria, we see even more profound effects. Uh, the atrium, for whatever, for we're not sure exactly why yet, uh, the adrenergic regulation of the L-type calcium channel is about double what we see in the ventricle. And in the rad mutant mice, uh, there's no regulation of L-type calcium channel in the atria as well. We looked at calcium fluorescence um, in, in, uh, under basal conditions. Um, the, the, the wild type and the rad mutant mice are approximately the same. In a, in a wild type uh, animal, in wild type cardiac myocytes, the calcium transient goes up about between about threefold. But in the mutant mouse, it goes up about only 70%. There's about an 80% reduction in the augmentation of the calcium transient in response to isoproterenol. In the ventricle, uh, for both uh, forskolin and for isoproterenol, and in the atrium, it's even more pro profound. There's about a 95% reduction in the calcium transient uh, when, when you cannot uh, phosphorylate RAD. The functional effects in a whole heart is, are, are profound as well. Uh, in, an, in a wild type animal, the EF uh, goes from about 50, 50 to 60 percent up to about 80 or 90 percent. But in the mutant mice, which, which have slightly reduced EF to begin with, 
uh, there is rarely very little change in the ejection fraction here. So there's a mild reduction in basal contraction and a marked reduction in uh, the augmentation uh, induced by isoprotonal. Running is the same. Uh, in our wild-type mice, we did two types of exercise testing on them, either a, a no-incline constant speed or a very aggressive 15% incline and progressive speed. Uh, the wild-type mice did reasonably well under the relatively mild conditions. They didn't do as well in an aggressive stimulation, but the rad mutant mice failed to, com to complete the 20-minute exercise markedly more in, uh, than the wild-type mice did. So rad mice had more failures and a re reduced latency to failure. We could flip it and, uh, and now prevent rad from inhibiting the channels by making a mutant beta subunit. We did this two ways, either with a transgenic approach or, um, or a CRISPR knock-in. And in this case here, the currents are increased. The, the V50 is shifted to the left. The calcium transients are almost what we would see with a wild-type animal that was treated with isoproteranol. And the ejection fractions are also almost what we would see with just the injection of, of, of a wild-type mice with isoproteranol. And there's no increase, meaning that this is the mechanism to explain a large amount of, of uh, the adrenergic augmentation of uh, ejection fraction and cardiac output. In, in a mouse. Let me just summarize then by just saying that what we've demonstrated today is the fight or flight response uh, for the heart requires augmentation of the calcium influx via, via rad phosphorylation. Rad phosphorylation is absolutely essential for the augmentation of the current amplitude here. There, the, the mech, there are, there, there, this is the mechanism to explain calcium influx regulation in the heart. It's also required for augmentation of the calcium transients and cellular contraction that I haven't shown you today. It's also required for stabilization of the sinus node function, work that I haven't shown as well in the interest of time. There's a slower heart rate and there's also uh, sinus node irregularity, especially after giving isoproteranol in these mice. And it's also required for augmentation of contraction in vivo. This work obviously could not be done with a great team of uh, people in my own lab, um, as well as graduate students and collaborators who are here today uh, as well, and obviously the work of uh, Marin Kolotsky and Steve Giggy, who did the mass spec work at Harvard. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. What a lot of work to get to the amazing conclusions. Amazing. Thank you. Questions? I know we're a little bit over lunchtime. Questions? Um, hello. Thank you so much for the great talk. Um, I was just wondering about the two types of calcium channels that you were hypothesizing. So I was wondering if you think the distribution of them around the entire heart is different because of the different results that you've seen in like uh, the ventricle and the atrium. Yes. Um, th that is a question that we're, we're exploring now as well. Wh why are some channels rad lists? And why are some channels rad bound? And can that be regulated? So radless channels are vital for all of us right now who are sitting here, except for perhaps me, who's maybe a little bit more radless. But um, you're going to have rad bound channels because that's your basal function. You need you, you're going to have radless channels because you need it to, to keep your your EC coupling going. Um, and then you're going to need a a, a, a a group of cell, a group of channels that are going to be rad bound. That's going to form your your functional reserve that we all need to escape from from the predators. How that works, I don't know exactly. It could be just base basal phosphorylation. It could be the amount of rad we have. The I didn't show today that the heterozygous mice are exactly in the middle. Um, and so it suggests that the amount of rad is going to be important in this process here. But what's going on, I don't, I don't know. It's a great question, though. Thank you. Great talk. Nice data. So 
the PKA or the rat mediated PKA response in calcium channels is really interesting, right? Do you think this is unique to calcium channels or are other channels regulated in the same way? I don't think it's unique. I, I think you, we just can compare it to circa and phospholambam. Uh, it's the same mechanism. You have phospholambam phospho gets phosphorylated and it disinhibits circa. I think this is an evolutionarily, I mean, somewhat primitive mechanism to regulate a channel. Uh, when you think of other channels that we've heard and see structures for, including, for instance, the ryanidine receptor that has phosphorylation sites, it's pretty hard to imagine how, how evolutions evolved a, a phosphorylation site that's accessible to kinases, phosphatases, but also then is able to transmit that to the pore of the channel in some way and get a, get a functional effect. Here, it doesn't matter where the phosphor, it does matter, the phosphorylation sites need to be on the carboxy terminus of RAD, and that's a whole nother story that we're developing now as well. But it doesn't matter what the serines are, as long as you remove the inhibition of RAD, you're gonna release it. And so you don't, it, it could explain why, why do why why in smooth muscle cells do you not see much regulation uh, by protein kinase A of, of the channel? In fact, we know that if we give adrenergic stimulation, you get a, a reduction in blood pressure. So that would not make sense for calcium channels to be activated in that situation. The brain probably doesn't have that much adrenergic regulation of, of L-type calcium channel either, although that is debatable, I recognize. And so you, don't ha you could explain a lot of this by not having RAD or not having REM around to explain regulation, and you don't need to impart splice variants and things like that. Just a guess. Well, um, you mentioned circa and phospholambin being some very similar mechanisms. So the physiological response of the beta-adrenergic stimulation, it requires both the RAD and the phospholambin, because if you don't have the loading of the SR, then you, it would, nothing would happen, right? So it's that both of them are required. Well, um, so, so models that have been, been, been proposed, first, the, the, the data about phospholambam for adrenergic inotropy is about maybe 20 or 30% 30, 30 is lost, is, is the data from the literature. And that, that perhaps correct, um, the, the modeling that was done by Don Burrs and Botaranko would suggest similar type of effects. So they've been able to model the cardiac myocyte over the over about five years ago, and they've demonstrated that if you remove phospholambam, you have about a 20, 20 25% reduction in inotropy and, and calcium transient. But if you remove L-type calcium channel, you have about a, almost 100% reduction. In it, that's for both a rabbit and for a mouse, and so you, you you can't you have to you have to have the fuel, and the L-type calcium channel is basically the fuel to keep this inotropy going. As far as our mice model, if you remove if you remove rad inhibition of the calcium channel, you probably have an eighty or ninety percent uh, augmentation of 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 the calcium transient and uh, inotropy, even without phosphorylation of phospholambam. That's at least in a mouse. It's probably enough circa to handle, to handle it. It's my bad. But it's an interesting question that we now have to address with more mouse models crossing mice and seeing what we get. 